You're listening to Beat Autoimmune and Thrive, the podcast all about reversing and preventing autoimmune conditions so you can live your most vibrant life as soon as possible. We talk about autoimmune root causes, actionable solutions, and inspirational healing stories. I'm Palmer Kippola, and I used to have MS. Today, I'm an author, a speaker, a functional medicine certified health coach, a pickleball player, and nature lover who's helped thousands of people reclaim their health and their best lives. Let's dive into this episode. I am delighted to be joined by Anthony Haynes today. Anthony has been in private practice for 28 years, and he's one of the most experienced registered nutritional therapist and one of the first practitioners to implement the principles of functional medicine in the UK. And that's been since 1992. He has seen over 18,000 clients, each of whom has taught him the principles or what that principles are what counts and not generic protocols. In addition to learning from his clients, Anthony has also researched and then presented on multiple different subjects over the 28 years he's also been teaching. Over the past decade, Anthony has focused much clinical and research time to addressing chronic hidden viral infections, and in particular, to their relevance to contributing to autoimmune disorders. He's met with hundreds of clients that have viral infections that have been identified with lab tests, and he's witnessed improvements in the vast majority of those clients after recommending a variety of remedies and natural substances to help his clients' immune systems to function more capably against those viruses. And I'm super excited to hear about that because I also know that infections are a profound underlying root cause of autoimmune disorder. So we'll have to have you back to talk about infections another time. Let me continue with the illustrious bio. Anthony is also a successful award-winning author of two books on nutrition, including The Insulin Factor and The Food Intolerance Bible. In 2011, Anthony was awarded the prestigious CAM magazine, which I assume stands for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Yes, uh, indeed. The award for outstanding practice for as many years of educating, inspiring, motivating, and helping practitioners and patients. I am delighted to call Anthony a friend. Uh, welcome, Anthony. It's so great to be with you today. Well, Palmer, thank you so much for, 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 for the intro because I, I know the words, but um, it's interesting hearing about oneself, isn't it? It's sort of like, gosh, is that, did I really do that? Was that what I mean? But thank you. <laughs> this is a pleasure to be with you. And certainly, I mean, our goal, as we talked about before, is really it's, it, it, it is serving others. And, and of course, we need to earn a living too. But but in this instance, uh, you know, this is the, this, this is not you're not paying for my time, but it is actually a pleasure to actually find the time and speak to you. And I I really enjoyed. I didn't know you in the audience um, when I was first giving a, a presentation on, on that radio show, and um, and then of course discovered your book. And I actually bought it forthwith. And and I have to say, having got the array of books from my friend Amy Myers, is a good friend of mine, um, and read others' books. Yours, I have to say, encompassed. This is that with no, without knowing you. It actually encompasses, I think, more of the factors, particularly with regard to the hormonal aspect, which virtually no mm. other author in autoimmunity talks about. So, it, it obviously, so I think your book, which is actually on your left shoulder, beat it beats <laughs> autoimmune. Um, it, it, it is a very, very, very good book. So, so mm. it's really where I get to understand the caliber of to whom I'm speaking now. Oh. Thank you very much indeed for having me, and I'm hoping we can enlighten folk uh, about the subject we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your generous feedback. I I so appreciate that. And you're an inspiration to me, Anthony. You're not only a terrific practitioner, you're a delightful person and a great presenter too. You've got this ability to take complex information and make it both interesting and fun, which is such a skill. And today we're going to be delving in to ways to we can frame this a couple of different ways, but one mm. of those ways is to counteract sarcopenia, which is a mm-hmm. very common and often age-related loss of muscle mass, strength, and function. But I guess if we put it in a more positive frame, we're going to be talking about dynamic movement and how to how to have optimal health and yeah, longevity exactly. so that we yes. can age well. Yeah. Right. Not so, not fulfill, not fulfill the prophecy of aging. Not fulfill the prophecy of aging. I mean, yes. we have experience, don't we? Watching people 
like both of my parents had a very long, slow decline, I guess, going this way, yes. if I'm doing to the camera, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so you just go along the baseline like this, you're hovering, and yeah. the quality of life is not very good. And our ideal would be to live a long, healthy life, and then one day in our yes. sleep. Which, right? is, which has been described as compressing morbidity into the very last moment of life. So effectively, you're fine, 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 and then you're not. Um, so that, that compression of morbidity, which when I first heard it, I didn't quite get to grips with what that meant. Compressing, obviously, you're, you're, you're pushing something in. Morbidity is actually unwellness, and then mortality will be the end of life. Yes. But you're compressing all the illness until the very last moment, which means you don't have any illness, and then... That's it. Thank you very much. So my granddad was was 106. And now you don't know this information. Wow. He was 106 when he died. And and at the age of he retired the year I was born in 1965. He retired. Um, and, and I discovered many, many years later that he actually inherited a phenomenal sum of money. It's a slight sidetrack. But he inherited a million pounds from Uncle Jim in 1961 or something. So before I was born, and I thought that him working for his job was just a very good job. And he always does a new Jaguar car. And I thought, I thought, well, he just earned it. No, he inherited it as well. So, but nonetheless, he, 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 uh, so he, he was too young for the first world war and too old for the second world war. And so that's how he got through essentially. I think that's how he made it through. Um, he, he played Fred Perry at tennis when he was younger, which, which was interesting, but 106. Now, when I thought, well, that's going to serve me well, but then I did some basic maths and I discovered that's one eighth of the genes. And how do I know it's the genes that are for longevity? So we have to take responsibility. I couldn't just sit on the laurels of my grandfather's age when he passed away. There's actually, so it's, it's the genes have effectively, of course, what load the gun and, and lifestyle is what pulls the trigger. So I, I figured that, you know, I can't rely on the fact that my granddad was that old um, because I've only got one eighth of his genes and who knows right. if one eighth of those genes is actually going to be the ones that can convey or confer longevity on me. So it's actually daily habits. And I'm a huge fan of doing relatively small things, um, but then there's important things every single day. And that, that phrase I use, which is fulfilling the prophecy of aging, I believe that there's a, there's a cultural, sociological, particularly in the Western world, and if ever we've been to other cultures, like there are certain places in Japan, certain places in Malaysia and Thailand and, and Georgia and various places around the world. I guess that's I guess the blue zones, potentially, which um, mm -hmm. which that journalist went to. Um, the old folk don't look like they're so old and they're engaged in stuff which which actually isn't is actually what the middle aged people are doing as well. So, in fact, there's no difference is they keep on doing. And I think there's this, there's something said we retire and therefore we've got to slow down. Yes. And actually, I would say that's one of the very first things to address is that do not allow yourself to lower the ceiling of your intensity of activity to mm. come down deliberately. Mm. If, if it's through accident or through a need, of course, that needs to happen. But uh, one of the key things and Albert Beckles, there's a brilliant, famous, gorgeous black bodybuilder who who was actually competing. He was 60 years old and competing against 25 and 30 year olds. Wow. You can only tell from his face. So wow. I remember reading about him when I was younger and he and he actually declared this. He said he's, he was the question is, how do you got to, be, to do this for so long? And he said, you know, I never let the intensity up. I always maintain the ceiling of peak mm. strength, but I just did less of it. And I trained less often because I couldn't handle it because I was getting older. So whilst we're all not bodybuilders, actually, we do have a body that builds itself anew. Yes. So so this building of the body we'll be talking about as, as well. So yes, yeah, sarcopenia is something that actually affects a huge number of people. So sarc means flesh and penia means poverty. So it's a lack of flesh. So it's a lack of it. So it's a natural process of losing and the flesh is lean muscle tissue. It's not belly fat or skin. It's lean muscle tissue. It's the active tissue, that, the tissue that shapes your body. So if you're walking behind someone, and I, I remember this as I used to walk to clinic when the clinic was open, I used to walk to clinic and in the Oxford Street in London and walk up to the clinic right in the middle of London. And I walked behind people and you could tell kind of va vaguely what age, you could tell if someone was an aged person because dare I say, dare I say the bum, bum was dropping a bit and the way they were walking and the way they were stooping. You can tell from someone's gait for someone's walk what yes. their age is yes. uh, and, and that's i guess how actors do it when you, when you see sort of a famous young actor playing an older actor they take on the posture that's and right. it's actually that posture and it's actually that's what i'm talking about is that don't let yourself do that don't let yourself oh, i'm gonna slow down now i'm older don't slow down well yes don't do something so so i would say reduce endurance and maintain your strength absolutely I love it. we'll be definitely talking about that i love it yeah we will dig into all of that i love it mm. and i i just want to set the frame a tiny yes. bit before we dig into it which is 
we both serve people with autoimmune conditions and most of people that have autoimmunity are women. And I would say, as we've discussed, that that sweet spot is in that perimenopause and menopausal age between the ages of say 46 and 55, right? That's it. That's um, it. And I think there's also a, there's an assumption that I think is a cultural norm that we're just going to become less strong as we age, that we are just going to lose muscle mass. And that is inevitable. And I really want you to address the, you know, this is not inevitable piece of it. And we can, we can practice those habits, those daily habits that you talk so beautifully about that can stack, that help us to live a long, healthy life. And I think that if you look at the woman that you and I both serve in that age group, who has a lot on her plate and she is stressed and she's got teenagers at home. She's got aging Mm. parents who aren't aging altogether gracefully. And if she can do anything for herself in the form of exercise, it's typically to go for a walk. So I just wanted to frame that as this is the typical person that you and I serve. And I'd like to think about it in, in that frame in terms of, okay, what would you recommend to this woman in particular who is doing what she can to just get out the door, maybe to mm-hmm. walk the dog for five or yes. 10 minutes once or yeah. twice a day. And, and is, is the sandwich filling? It's and sandwich is the sandwich. It's, uh, yes. Supporting the, the, the elder and supporting right. the younger. That's it's, right. Uh, sandwich pulled and pushed. And all I've got time for is this. And so it, it, it's, it's, it's very challenging. Now, I would say the, f- the first step is an appreciation of where someone's at. So it's really appreciating where someone's at and never not making assumptions. So where are you at? What would you like to do? And this person may not have actually engaged in any formal t- type of exercise or, or strength building mm-hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. But lo and behold, there comes a time where for every single woman, it's basically, I would say, a fact. It's a fact. At the age of 40 onwards, 45, 46 onwards, um, unless you do some physical activity, it, it really will be a predictable phenomenon. So, so whilst you and I can't see the future, I would estimate that we probably could in these instances, it's actually almost cartoon. We could draw what the body's going to, what's going to happen right. That's to right. the body. It's good. This That's is right. going to, you know, everything's going to go south, as they say. Yes. Um, and it really is. And the one thing that holds it up that's, that keeps it in the north is muscle, lean muscle tissue. Right. We have voluntary control over skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle holds our body in shape. And there's a, there's a, 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 I mean, how many, how many girls and boys do I know? I know many more women than, than, than the men, because in my field, the vast majority of clients and the practitioners are women. So I've, I've been surrounded by a lovely, lovely groups of women um, in my life. And it's, um, there is, I don't really have many conversations with women about training, about, about a sort of a, a training program, about exercise. I generally don't. And, and it's usually with my the tennis playing friend or a, a gym friend. And, and they're usually they usually men. So there's this sort of muscle and men, and muscles not for women. Right. I'm not suggesting that we become you become muscular and therefore can't fit in your clothes and it looks unsightly. And you you it's like ooh. And 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 I've had that reaction many many times. I think this is a misnomer. Women's muscles, and if you do build muscle that quickly, well, my my thought is you maybe you you actually get a documentary of yourself, take photos before and after, sell lots of books, and then you can stop <laughs> the exercise. You can, on resting on your laurels and all the books you sold about how you got fitter at that age. And That's bigger. right. But women's muscles are denser, not bigger. So men's muscles get bigger, more grossly, and they're more mm. obvious. And women's muscles are more dense. So I'm not talking about about getting obviously more muscular and then looking something like something you don't want to look like, but it's actually retaining strength flexibility reaction speed it's actually maintaining your youth and it basically and if one's not used to doing something one tends not to like it so i think the first place is to appreciate where someone's at and then actually begin with this education process you're saying did you know that the the one major thing that you can do to protect your health and actually protect your body from going maybe the same way as mom and dad did um let me have a look at them and see where they're at is is actually engaging your muscles is actually training your body to be to be effectively up for and capable of doing things that um what can i say is not just not just doing nothing you want to you, you only right. can train your body if your training is harder than anything you will encounter in your life then everything in your life will be more easy to do and that's something that i do compare when i have tough times uh, i think well i've actually been through worse times than this i survived it so this is going to be okay that's kind of the way i talk to myself mm-hmm. okay it's a tough time i'm mm-hmm. very anxious about this but you know i've got a lot to, gone through a lot worse 
So, but the physical activity aspect, for a lot of women, it's something that it's, it's anathema. So one needs to find the right environment, the right activity that'd be relevant for that person. Mm. Um, there are different ways. So going to a gym might be suitable for some, having a lovely personal trainer. It could be a very lovely other relationship, which actually almost like a therapist. It could be, it could be fantastic. In America, it's a lot more common uh, than England, but even now in England, yeah. personal trainers are, are, are kind of everywhere. And and I just are, are generally very lovely people to get on with. And they become like a third place friend. Um, and so they become that confidential confidant. So it's actually, it's a, it's a nice relationship. And then they have that relationship with most of their clients. So it's, it, it's a nice relationship to have in itself. It's rewarding, but strengthening your body and having someone to teach you initially, at least yeah. what to do. Yeah. You don't have to engage with them every time so that you're learning what to do to, to move your body. Some people it could be, but it, but it needs to be engaging your body so that it responds to the stimulus to get stronger. That so makes walking, walking with Hama doesn't cut it. Yes. It, it's important and essential. And it's something not to stop doing, right? Mm. You want to be walking, yeah. but wouldn't you say you want to, this is an additive strategy and not yeah. necessarily a replacement strategy, maybe a couple times a week, or I, maybe you don't share mm. that perspective. Yeah. I like both. I, I think it depends where I think I agree walking in itself. In fact, walking um, is actually one of the means by which you can assess whether you're on the way to sarcopenia, which is this mm. lack of, of flesh. So actually walking gait speed is referred to as gait in the mm. literature. Gait, it's walking gait. So this is why walking behind someone, you can actually, walking along with someone, you can kind of tell where they're at because generally the, the slower the walking speed, um, well, the more likely they are to head towards sarcopenia. So just as a point of reference, walking, very useful. And if you can have brisk walking, um, then I think that's very good. It may be better than jogging, in fact, because jogging, you've got more weight, but we you know weight on your knees and ankles, whereas walking, it's less weight, but actually it's a, a longer stride mm -hmm. and you're engaging more muscle in the striding walking than you are in jogging. So I prefer fast walking than jogging in that sense. Yeah. But I, fast walking is great and it definitely, it, it definitely keeps it because it's also activating the nerves that are influencing the muscles. So it's very, I think walking, great. And I would recommend, I mean, I have said at least twice a week, once a week is going to be tough. Two or three or four times a week, I would engage in some form of resistance exercise, whether that's a yoga, whether it's actually, you know, it could be obviously you've got gentle yoga, or tough yoga, and yoga can be as hard as you make it, essentially. So that's actually putting your body weight against gravity in, in a fixed position, which is actually engaging in muscle contraction. Stretching is still a muscle workout. And that's an important point as well. So mm. stretching is a muscle workout um, for sure. And one wants to warm up the muscles before you stretch. Don't stretch before you warm up. It's very important. And then there's actually then there elastic bands or bands. You've got this very different thickness of bands mm -hmm. that you can do resistance exercise with. And that can be very gentle on the joints. And then you actually got actual weights themselves. You've got you've got also got you can carry weights when you're walking. So there are all kinds of different forms. And I say wherever you're at, start somewhere. And then, and then engage in exercise that actually is hard to do by definition. So it's hard. And this is where the attitude comes in. And I cannot um, inflict or force or project my attitude or your attitude onto somebody else saying, well, if you get this, then it'll be easy for you. But the sooner one changes one's attitude to, OK, well, this is actually what it takes. Because a lot of people actually, I found, resist things that are hard. Excuse the pun on those words. Mm, but they actually great. resist hard work. And in fact, it's actually hard work that I now absolutely love. I, I mean, I literally love hard work because I know I'm signaling my body to respond and adapt to that hard work. And that adaption will maintain my youth. I love it. I love it. And, and we actually call this a hormetic response, right? Yes. I mean, yeah. it's kind Hormesis. of like what doesn't, what doesn't kill us makes, kill us, yeah. makes us yeah. stronger. Yes. There's truth to it. And the idea the no pain, no gain with weightlifting and so forth. I think, mm. I think people have a perception that it is, as you've already shared, a male oriented thing to do. Um, and I think that people resist things that are hard. I think you've just hit it right on the head. We always look for the easiest path, the path of least resistance. Yeah. And mm -hmm. here we're talking about the need to add resistance and whether you have a, a stack of weights or yeah. bands or just body weight. I mean, you can give us, and, and I hope you will give us a perspective on what's going to happen if you don't start to employ this resistance training, this weight training could be even body weight training. What's, you know, what's one path, one outcome, yeah. if you yeah. don't do that so that people I think mm. part of the education is not just how to lift weights, but I want to to kind of shake people up to know mm. this is this is critical. 
yep. to your watch health out, and watch well-being. Watch out, watch out. And it's great in the dynamic conversation we're having. I've said, I've made a note here, is that the, 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 the sarcopenia is synonymous with the path of least resistance. I love that. It, it is yeah. actually sarcopenia, path of least resistance. Yes. That's it. And, and when have we ever learned, when we, no matter what culture you're in, forgive me, I don't know any culture, where, where the, the, yeah, tell you what, don't worry, do it tomorrow. Yeah, don't, yeah. No, 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 stay, stay, stay where you're at. Stay sitting, that's fine. You know, stay where you're at. Don't move. You know, that's going to get you, that's going to get you what you need. No, no, no. Sarcopenia in the path of leaf resistance is synonymous. So it's great to come up with that. So effectively, envisage this. Well, certainly it depends on what one's heritage is. So genes do play a role, there's no doubt about it. But lifestyle, I'm a big fan of epigenetics, which is really the expression of what that's we right. do in our lifestyle, our thoughts, the food we eat on Everything. those gene expressions. Mm-hmm. We can change gene expression, even at the age of 90. So I've actually heard of people who are literally in bed in a, in a ward of old folks. They're a geriatric ward. Um, this is long before the current pandemic situation. And, and I met a, geri- a geriatric doctor who is 60 himself and his dad is 89. He's in the ward and he sees the quality of life that his dad's in. And he goes, I can't bear it. I can't bear it. I, I, I could bear it for my client, my patients. But actually now I see my dad there. And so he has, he has a sort of like a, the, 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 the veils are removed and he goes, my God, dad, I can't have you living behind a curtain and a bunch of old people who are just going to literally waiting for you, waiting to die. Mm-hmm. So he gets his dad involved in lifting the bedpan up a few times and then a heavy book and then, and then he gets bands and basically he gets his dad to be capable of dressing himself and having the dignity for that. And this is obviously talking about a man, but the same applies to women. And it's, it's actually having the ability to be independent. independent. So he got a shock when he saw his dad in that place. He got his dad out of the war. He got his dad into his own room. Dad could dress himself. He could bathe mm-hmm. himself. And the quality of life and the dignity that he had at the end of his life, um, fundamental. And that's a great story for a man who basically lived and allowed allowed it to happen. He, this is the way it is. Old people come in. They're sitting here. And basically, they're behind the thing. They get they, um, A nurse comes in, washes them, uh, closes the bedpan, wipes their bottom. And it's like, oh. And what then, kind of then, life is this hovering along the baseline around so the bottom, just waiting to that, die? And that's an example of an, of an 18 year old. But don't get to 60, don't get to 70 and then go, oops. That's because right. once, you, once you're in the hole, it is more, the less muscle you've got, the less strength you've got, the less capable you are of improving it. The rates of improvement become less and less. It's not quite exponential or algorithmic, but it's the, 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 the more you get down to lean, lack of strength, the more and more difficult it takes. Because if you've got, let's say, 10 muscle fibers and it, it takes you a while to train those to, to have the strength of 11, to strength of 12, to 13, you're going to go up in ones. If you have if you have 50 muscle fibers and you use some training, you get to 60, you get to 70. And so it's a much, it's an, it's, it is an exponential process. In fact, I'm wrong. It is an exponential process. And maintaining where you're at, as Albert Beckles, if you ever check him out, Albert Beckles, a lovely man, um, he, he talked about maintaining the intensity, the ceiling height of intensity. So what tends to happen with women in particular, but also with men, I've seen it in, in my stepfather, my father, is that, oh, I'm getting over and older now. I won't do that. Mm-hmm. And so instead of appreciating, well, actually, because I'm getting older, I'll do it. So it's a, it, it flips it because I'm getting older. I'd better do it, but I won't do it 10 times. I'll do it five times. Right. Whatever that whatever that might be. So I used to go to my stepfathers and, and my fathers to, to to shift the mattress around on their bed and then to lift the heavy potted plants in the garden. So on the weekends I was there, I would say, right, roll up my sleeves, here we go, and I would do the heavy labor. It wasn't particularly heavy labor, but it's too heavy for them. But they some stage they made a decision, I can't do that, and they stopped. But as soon as they stopped, they went below a level. Mm. So that's obviously a quick example. Now for women, women's bodies are, are, are different. There tends to be a higher fat percentage, it's typically true. And it's perhaps all the more important to maintain body shape to maintain some degree of musculature. But it's not, it's not bodybuilding, it's maintaining strength. So I would say that the alarm thing, well, we tend not to think ahead, but, but come around 45 to 55, intimations of mortality tend to cross one's mind. And especially if one's hair is turning gray and the female cycle's changing and then oh, what's going to happen now? And then some physical changes and, and it's more obvious physically. And women's, the hormonal change happens so quickly relative to men. Obviously, there is a menopause um, and that's well documented. And that happens over a longer period of time. For some men, it does happen quicker. But it's the sort of thing where, where we want to maintain you, you want to maintain yourself. So that's the time you, we want to engage in something that's going to it's going to push your body. And remember, it's necessarily needs to be hard to stimulate the body's response and then we need to nourish ourselves as well as possible in order to to actually have the internal signals that can support the healing process and the growth from those external ones of the exercise so before you get into those nourishing pieces let's first identify how can someone tell 
if they are on the path of sarcopenia? What are uh, some yeah. tests or strength exercises or yes. what can people do to measure where they are right now? With, and then yeah, sure. we're going to talk about how to overcome that. Yeah. And then finally, how to measure it on an ongoing basis. Yeah. We don't know. We, let's say we're not going to a lab, not having an MRI scan or CT scan or blood pod testing. Or, so, we, so those things we're going to put to one side. So, so um, certain door handles may be difficult to open. Certain jars may be difficult to get the lids off. Yeah. And you might know that you might you might say, well, I, I like this particular pot of honey or whatever it might be, or pickles. Often the pickles are pretty tightly screwed on the gherkins or whatever it might be, and or the beetroot or whatever it might be. It's like ah, or the sauerkraut. It's like that. That's now hard for me to do, even even with the dry, even with the cloth on top. And so those markers where it's actually the hand grip strength hand grip. and there's it's called di- this is a dynamometer. So I happen to have a, a cheap plastic um, one where as you see the dial here. And as mm-hmm. I as I pull, you may be able to see it change. Oh, yes. The dial goes up and, and so it's a bit cranky. This spring isn't working so well and you can reset it uh, and do the other hand. So it's been found that the dynamometer grip grip strength in one's hand is the simplest, best parallel associate marker that reflects sarcopenia strength. Because actually, it's the strength. And so in fact, sarcopenia, which is a Latin term referring to lack of flesh, is actually maybe it'd be better as dynapenia, which is actually a lack of strength. So actually lifting bags, lifting the, the shopping. So you get the same shopping, the same shopping, the same shopping, and that gets heavier and heavier. That's a sign. Um, you discover, you discover that you're walking more slowly. That's a sign. You can't open the lid. That's and so we've got a certain door handle in our house where it's a, it's a circular one. It's interesting that certain states in the country in the U.S. have actually said no, we're banning handles and we're only having or we're only having handles or not having these because mm. old people can get trapped inside. But in a southern state where there are bears, they're saying no levers. We must have the round ones. So I learned that about America. Very interesting about door handles and legislation. But door handles, um, things to open. So you can notice when you're getting you're getting weaker, and that's telling us, uh oh. You know, there is a lack of strength and lack of yeah. strength, really, really important. It's unlikely that you're going to go to a gym and do and, and do a leg extension where you sit on the thing and lift up with your knees and you, you exercise squat or do a squat test with a weight on your back. But those are measurements, too. Um, but there is also there's a set of scales. and I'm not sure if you have them in, in, in the US where it looks at your your body mass comp- composition and mm-hmm. they're not 100 accurate compared to but they are they could be useful so you stand on the scales with bare feet yes. um and uh, it, it assesses your your body composition so that could be maybe available at the gym and not necessarily something you have to buy yourself at home so there are means but also you can tell by looking now now it may be if you get to a beach you can say well actually this is what i looked like on the beach on my on my photographs 10 years ago this is five years ago and this is this year so you can actually do a self-comparison it's difficult when you look yourself in the mirror all the time uh, because it's a slow process is is actually check check yourself out physically i'm not talking about getting tep- taping a tape measure and wrapping it around your bicep or your thighs obviously the legs are the biggest muscles but um so it's really a question of its strength its walking speed um and actually that the hand strength the grip strength has been associated with that and what's also fascinating palmer is that the blood test correlation of an inflammatory marker called c-reactive protein which is a bad molecule, it signifies you've got too much inflammation, is directly correlated with hand grip strength. The more hand grip strength you've got, the lower the CRP. Absolutely amazing. Wow. Wow. That is fascinating. And I've also heard that hand grip strength is one of the best, do you call it markers or tests for all-cause mortality? Mm. I mean, it's like a proxy. Yes, which is actually what CRP is. Yeah. With that inflam- yeah, inflammation, I had not put that together. That is so interesting. Yeah. And and people can get those squeezy things. So I go for walks with my husband. We hike multiple times a week. And he's got a wrist curler thing and a hand grip squeezer thing. Yes. And we switch off yes. because it just didn't appeal to me or occur to me. But then I started learning that this is this is a big deal. You can't just have strong forearms. You need, you know, all around strong muscles. But yeah. this particular one yeah. is particularly important. Do. So mm. now that um, we know. We use our hands for, for virtually everything. Mm. We use our hands for virtually everything. So now that we know, we know our weight, we're our gait, we know our um, uh, our strength. And maybe we do a test like with this dynamometer if we get this for, I, I think, 20 bucks probably on Amazon, right? Um, and those scales yeah. are available in the U.S. and they're relatively inexpensive. Every year, 
the price comes down on these things, but it gives you your BMI in addition to your weight. And, and that's a useful yeah. and, and the, the name of a, a brand in the UK. Oh, so sorry. Just no, like lag on that on the, uh, uh, the one, the, one of the brands anyway is Tanita. I don't know Tanita. if it's the same in the U S Tanita, T A N I T A Tanita scales. Uh, and I've used those in clinic and they can be useful for, for actually clients coming back and actually having a retest. People like seeing retests, but that's again, great. a useful marker. So it, it could be, it could be very obvious that, that you've, you've gained fat and lost strength, but it may not be. Um, and if you were to go to uh, having a health check or a strength, a better strength test, but the strength test, yeah, it's, it's really a question of whatever you're used to, you'll be stronger at, but I think, I think we got it, but I, I that, that, taking the lids off things it, it's a pretty good that's indicator a great that, that's, one i love it and it's so it, easy it's to do it's so easy downhill. easy to test at home you don't need to go to a special gym or someplace yeah. right now to do these these tests so let's dig into what can people do about it i mean we've yeah. touched on it a little bit but um I, I think it's more holistic than just weightlifting so talk to us about yes, you know maybe is, what definitely. are your top strategies yeah. for what people can do as a practice on a daily basis or every other day or something like that well, I think dynamic movement is a good way of describing it. Dynamic movement, and it requires diarizing. So there's a plan. So without a plan, as you, you probably, you don't have a plan if you don't have a plan. You sit down and have a plan. So it's actually engaging in a certain amount of exercise. And I'll start gradually. I wouldn't do something too intensively that then actually ends up with an injury or you end up recalling from because it was so hard that week, I can't possibly do it again. So real practical change. For changes to occur, there needs to be an intellectual understanding why you're doing it. Um, and then you need to share that plan with a partner and or a friend or a group. You need to share it. So share the group. So we say, I'm going to do the London Marathon this year. I'm going to tell your group and raise some money for charity. Well, you're going to be doing it no matter what. So, so you make, you announce to the world you're going to be making these changes and you can be doing this every day. That will be inspiring for others. Then others can give you feedback and can ask you about it. So it's actually putting it out there, putting it in the diary and Love actually it. and diarizing time. I am I am an absolute, I am awful at, at saying something and not putting it in the diary and then it doesn't get done. Whereas I say it, I know I'm going to put it in the diary and then it gets done. So it's about being practical. And it's really a question of, uh, would, would you prefer to do yoga? In which case, so yoga is fantastic. Stretching is great. So you could do, you could get online and everything's online nowadays, but you get amazing yoga classes and you can do, you can set it to your own level. And so you, there's, a, there's an array of yoga classes. You could do Pilates maybe less easy because you need more of a direct hands-on from the, the practitioner. But certainly doing yoga, doing stretching and, and all kinds of exercises is available from watching videos. So you can copy it. And if you had a mirror in the room, that could check your form while you do it to help prevent injury and doing it in the right style, the right mm -hmm. format. So I think diarizing that. So you could diarize, right, I've got a walk every day. And on, and on two or three days, I'm going to do fast speed walking. So you could time yourself with a stop watch. It doesn't have to be too right. Okay, yeah, that took me 25 minutes. Right. And then then da, 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 months later, it took it takes me 20 minutes. I've actually not five minutes off my walking. I'm walking faster. So you're 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 gradually building up that endurance of the walking. Then you could be using um, yoga. So, so instead of doing a sort of 30 minute yoga, I'll do 35 minutes. So I'll do a higher level of yoga, whether it's Ashtanga or hot yoga. You can actually then copy that. So it's about it's about making progress from wherever you're at. And I think sharing it with others is also a very useful thing. You could also use bands. So there are various different bands you can buy, different widths that have different tensile strengths. And lifting your arms up with a band, okay, that's easy peasy for me. So I'll actually use the thicker band. Okay, right, I can do 10 of those, right? And then I, 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 I go to relative failure. So, but you need to go roughly to failure um, within, I would say, within 15 repetitions. Otherwise, it's not going to stimulate the that, that external stimulus for adaptation. So 15 repetitions, I would say, 12 to 15, failing on that. If you do if you do heavier than that, that's fine, but I wouldn't go more than 15 reps. If 15 is easy and 20 is possible, then that isn't necessarily heavy enough to get the response from the body. So I'd say 12 to 15 repetitions for most people, and then you can go from there. But certainly warming up with an exercise that you're not used to, it's worth doing higher reps and lower weight just to get your muscles used to the range of motion mm -hmm. and then doing the thicker bands. So I've got three sets of bands and actually the thickest one I haven't used yet. It is so tough. I, I can't use, so I've just used the thin green one and I've used the orange one, but I can't use the purple one, you know? So, so band, I find bands very useful. You've also got um, isometric devices such okay. as springs 
um, sort of like they're called bulwark, as I think they're called rather oddly, um, but where you stretch something and hold it isometric. So isometrics are also very useful for muscle strength and growth. Uh, and, I, and I've read studies where they've compared um, movement exercises, like weight lifting and, and isometrics, and the participants had the same strength gains doing one or the other. So it was, it was the, the same, essentially. So you've also got isometrics. And I've got one implement with, with five springs the pull if you attach all five springs it's the, it's the hardest but you could detach a spring or two or three you could start on one spring and then build up and then that gives a whole sequence of exercises of pulling the the springs so it's a bit like a band uh, but just in a certain format um so it's i think diarizing fast walking um having some record some monitoring system of what i call biofeedback so you give yourself feedback so you know what you're doing and you're getting stronger so as we age as we go forward in time we're actually getting stronger and faster and then you're counteracting that trajectory, which things remaining equal, uh, the path of least resistance would in fact be rather downhill. And you might end up, dare I say, like, like your parents or somebody else's parents that you know, who simply sat around when they retired and, and guess what they were good for? They were good for sitting, sitting around. That's right. huh. So I think there's, um, uh, if you ride horses, for example, um, which might be for some, then it's engaging the core, but it's not really gilding your muscle. So there are certain physical activities which are great for us. But I would say the key is to actually exercise in a safe, controlled way to strengthen muscle strength. And that does require a commitment to that process. I think yoga, yoga is very, very good news indeed, because you're taking your whole weight and you're holding on one leg for posture, etc. I certainly find my legs wobble um, and yet I can lift a very heavy weight with squats. But I, but I can't hold the same yoga posture as long as my wife can, for example. That's so, true. She's That's much, true. Much, uh, and it's lighter. also wonderful for balance. Um, yoga is another yes. wonderful, wonderful. It's got the flexibility, strength, and balance. And I think that is, there's a gracefulness mm. about that, that yeah, engages definitely. more than just that, that weightlifting kind of brute strength. Mm. Yeah, I, I actually, I don't call it, I prefer not to call it weightlifting, although it is a thing. I would actually say it's muscle, it's muscle training. So actually it's, it's muscle, so it's really focusing on it's muscle training. So if you're lifting a, a weight and you're sort of got, you're jerking your body around and, and you lift a heavy weight, well, I didn't care about that. Actually, you want to keep form and purely exercise that range of muscle. So I call it muscle training and not weight training, in fact. So Beautiful. it's actually what you want to focus on. So I'm training my muscles. And by training the muscles, what's also wonderful, as you may well appreciate, is particularly if you're training your legs, the biggest muscles we've got on our body, you actually can help to stimulate something that actually helps our brain to keep young. And, that, and the number of substances that are produced by that process, and one of them is called, uh, just for our interest, is BDNF. It's brain-derived neurotropic factor. Um, and you and I may have learned from Dr. David Perlmutter yes. that very information, who is a lovely genius neurologist who I've known for over 20, I've known him for 25 years. He probably doesn't know me. But... Um, bdnf and you stimulate that with exercise there's very few things you can eat to stimulate it but exercise is one of those factors so exercising it doesn't just keep your body younger it keeps your brain younger Absolutely. so the beauty is by engaging in that muscle resistance work by stimulating the muscles you actually stimulate the production of agents that actually help to keep your brain younger i love it i love it now you mentioned eating so let's touch on yes. eating for this muscle growth and yes. throughout our lives, because I think especially women don't get enough of this particular food. So talk to us about the importance. Yes. And the, the single most important nutrient, and there are, there are 50 or 48 to 51 essential nutrients, depending on which table you look at, um, protein is the most important one for muscle growth. Protein comes from the Greek word protos. Protos means first. It's the first most important nutrient to consume. Everything in your body pretty much is made from protein and maybe protein and fats. There is nothing made in the body from carbohydrate. Carbohydrate is, in fact, stunningly not an essential nutrient. That's right. Um, so carbohydrates are not an essential nutrient. There are essential fats and there are essential proteins. And the proteins are made up of a certain number of amino acids and there are essential amino acids. And the three of the essential amino acids are particularly important for muscle. But we need to have all the essential amino acids, which we get from animal proteins. Very, very rare to find any vegetarian protein. Possibly soya might come into that category, but I wouldn't recommend too much soy. Uh, because of the allergenic nature. I'd also recommend GMO-free soy, of course. And so it's quite high on the list of, of food reactivities and also it may have been sprayed heavily. So it needs to be organic and non-GMO, but I wouldn't eat too much of it anyway because it could negatively affect your thyroid. Um, so that's a consideration, but otherwise it's a, it's a protein derived from an animal protein. So it's fish and it's meats and it's eggs. 
effectively. And we need to eat, uh, eat enough of the protein in order to have that counteractive effect. And what I've noticed, and maybe you too, Palmer, is that I've noticed my parents and certainly older folk, of course, I, I feel I'm undiluted in the sense that uh, I'll admit it, I'm 55, but I do feel like I'm 39 or 19, or it's just I completely lose track of my, because actually I just don't, and people meet me and I meet clients who are younger than me and they can't believe that I'm that I'm older than them. Hopefully it inspires them to think, well, maybe I could do something to change that. But I, I guess I'm blessed with the fact that actually I've had a rather dedicated um, aspect to my own health. But um, so effectively, well, as we get older, we tend to eat less protein. We as a, as, a, as a culture, at least at least in England, we do. I don't know if that's the same in the it's US. It's true. It's true. And there's a disposition to say, well, I, I don't want to eat so much meat. I want to and I want to be, become more vegetarian, certainly with certain movements. And, and movements towards vegetarian and veganism we need we need 1.2 to 1.5 to 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram in the body now what does that actually mean and without actually I mean, what does that mean well it, basically what it means is it means eating so I, I, i'll give you some total grammage if you like so i weigh 70 kilograms um and i know, I know women might make, maybe weigh 60 kilograms or 55 if you weigh 60 kilograms, you'll need 72 to 90 grams of protein. So there's a definite range uh, of protein to get the protein you need to support the muscle growth. If you're 65 uh, kilograms, you need to have about 78 to about 98 grams of protein. If you're 70 kilograms like me, it's about 84 to 105 grams. And if you're 75 kilograms, it's 90 to 112. And if you're 80 kilograms, it's 96 to 120 grams. So what I've done before, and you may recall this, is if we translate that into eggs alone, if we say a large egg, and it may be an overestimate, contains seven grams of protein, mm -hmm. seven grams of protein. And let's just go, let's go to the 60 kilogram weight. We need 72 to 90 grams. So I have to have a calculator here. Um, and I'm just going to do some basic maths. Um, so if I've got 70, let's go to the lower weight. So 72, or let me see, divided by seven. Well, I, I've got the idea that's going to be just over 10. You need that's 10 eggs a day. If we're just choosing eggs in the unlikely scenario of, of egg, just one source of protein, providing us with the protein we need on any given day to help prevent the loss of muscle tissue, we need we need to eat 10 and 10 and a bit eggs a day. So if you're if you're 70 kilograms like me, um, then we then uh, you know, then I need to eat you know more and more eggs. So it is it, it's actually much more protein than we think. And so a lot of people might think, well, this is a high protein diet. And I go, no, 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 it's not a high protein diet. This is a protein adequate diet. Yeah. And so the, this these figures come from the world, the international and continental um, authorities on sarcopenia. There are working groups in Asia, Europe. Um, there's international one as well. And there's another group as well. So the South, South America, North America, Asia, Europe and an international body. There are five bodies that I know of, at least where they employ people full time for the research into the subject of sarcopenia. So these are PhDs, medical scientists, MSCs, doctors. And this, these figures come from their research. And every single group around the world has yeah. come to that conclusion. You need 1.2 to 1.5, 1.6 grams of protein uh, per kilogram. So, so in so the U S this is not, this is not massive. This is not a protein diet to your point, but, but just for the, the conversion, because we use pounds in the U S so would somebody oh, who's yes. a woman weighing 130 pounds, multiply that by 1.2, um, to get the minimum daily protein requirement. Am I doing that right? Okay, so um, it's two point two. So, so could we? Have, so, if it's one hundred and twenty pounds, one hundred twenty pounds, one hundred and thirty, one hundred twenty pounds divided by two point. Oh, sorry, one hundred thirty. So, one hundred thirty. Right, very good. To to divide it by two point two five is. I get that right. So, one hundred thirty divided by two point two five um, is fifty seven kilograms. Fifty so fifty eight kilograms. So fifty eight times one point two. Um, yeah, is 70 kilograms, 70, 70, 70, so 70, 70 grams, grams of protein, protein, which would be, which would be 10 eggs a day. Yes. And, and we know in the autoimmune world that most people do not do well with eggs. So we need to make that conversion to yes. other types of meat, wild meat, 100% yes. grass fed lamb, elk, bison, venison. Yes. I don't see enough people eating enough of the spectrum of wild meats, but those are all considerations. Yes. Pastured, um, would that we have more in this country sure. and i hope the number oh. in it sorry no 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 please over. i would um, would that yeah, we have more we, 
Yeah, we um, we we in France, um, which is across the Channel. Um, it's another country entirely. We've been at war, with France, for so many hundreds of years. Um, but they do eat a lot more organ meats, and they're much more into their into that sort of um, uh, wild meats. But in this country, it's it's you know it's breast of chicken, not leg of chicken, and it really we have lost sight of it. So unless we go to the country, we find that someone's got that those meats available for generally in the supermarkets they don't the grocery stores they don't actually have that but i agree with you completely well, is this egg good for me or is this chicken good for me i say well it depends what the chicken ate and what the lifestyle it led <laughs> and so you can't that's tell right. if something's good for you you know well, it depends what what life it led that's and what right. it was fed and so we know that that's that the farm salmon when they're fed grain food actually oh. are actually de- definitely almost bad for you whereas wild salmon are good for you Yes. You know, if you if you eat fish, if you eat that fish, please stay so away um, from farm well, fish eat, that <laughs> yes. that eat corn. Farm fish is if you actually if you all you got to do is watch half an hour documentary on it, and you will not eat that that fish ever again. Absolutely. It, so so we uh, need to we need to consider all yeah. of the protein sources. A lot of people have yes. issues with eggs. So I just want people to be expansive yeah, with their thinking. We have a wonderful company here. I have no affiliation with them called U.S. Wellness Meats. They do mail order. So mm. if you're living in a place that does not have access to high quality meats, that's a great one to use. I think it's grasslandbeef.com is wow, the website. Fantastic. We love that because it offers a mm. variety of different types of meat, including, as I mentioned, the bison and the elk and the venison. Yes. So I just want to throw that out because I think that people don't know what to eat frequently that keeps them from yeah. stocking up the freezer. And this is something to consider because you're going to need. And again, you can do yeah, just that stock up the freezer. You can actually get, right. do one purchase and have it in the freezer. And so of course we're, we're, we're into fresh whole food, but it, but actually it means to get the protein to have that quality of meat is such an important thing. And so the protein is the single most important thing. And all the studies all, across all the world indicate that's the case. So what, what, what confuses me is that, well, how can people say, well, no, you can get by on a vegetarian diet, et cetera. I've seen that Netflix film, um, da, 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 et cetera. And so I'm thinking, well, th- this is all the evidence of all the scientists that spend their life looking at this information. It's not, they've got no vested interest. They're not partisan at all. Right. It is, this is, this is the basis. And this is what I've seen in reality as well in my own clinical practice with my own eyes. And so it's, it's, and it's not high protein. It just might feel like high protein because you haven't been doing it. And it's actually basically having protein at each meal and you need to have a good portion of protein each meal. And that will probably just about come close. But most people, if they're doing exercise, actually need to have some other source of protein, like a protein shake or protein powder after the exercise they might do, let's say, after your yoga class, you know, have a, have a protein smoothie in addition to three meals where there exists protein within it. And we, we can only eat protein, fats and carbohydrates. And we know, don't we, that having too much carbohydrates of many different types of carbohydrates is a negative factor, quite apart from the potential issue of food reactivity or indeed the spraying of the crops with glyphosate and Roundup right. that may actually be negative on those grains or, or other foods that we think are healthy but aren't necessary. See, organic is, is one thing. Organic is vital away from the, those sprays. So carbohydrates increase insulin carbohydrates are not necessary carbohydrates increase body fat increase triglycerides and so we've got to have other 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 calories to get the calories you've got to eat enough protein and fat That's right. and then vegetables now the vegetables is the next thing as i go on farmer is that r- oxidative stress so free radicals um is a phenomenon of any respiratory organism on the planet we breathe in oxygen we've got this free radicals forming so the next component other than protein is having adequate antioxidants from our vegetable intake and so it's lots of colorful veggies uh, organic in nature but a whole rainbow of color so one of the things i would recommend actually i recommend my clients have to get a little whiteboard up in the kitchen put your name and have a table during the week and then you actually and you you add, you get to mark your own box only and you get to mark how many colors you've eaten in a in a day and yeah. you can cross so and then you get to add up the numbers of colors you've eaten in the week so it's just a fun family thing to do uh, you could actually you could do very different systems but you get the idea whiteboard name the different you can have different numbers of foods eaten per day but i like the colors so it's a go for the colors how many different colors did you have on your plate today and so it's the oranges the reds the greens the purples um it's quite difficult to get blue other than blueberries um and obviously green is quite easy and and uh, oranges and so on so the colors and the colors contain different flavonoids and antioxidants and polyphenols that reduce oxidative stress and fundamentally farmer it's oxidative stress which drives the process of loss of muscle known as sarcopenia. This is unbelievable. I mean, it just all goes together. You can't separate any of this out. So I came to this discussion knowing that we were going to talk about muscle training, 
right? Resistance training. And I knew we would talk yes. a bit about protein, but I think it's essential. And you can't have that, those discussions without looking at what not to do. And, you know, in fact, you need those colorful vegetables to support the growth of those muscles. And you also need proper hydration, which I think a lot of people, you know, don't get enough. And we talk about this in one of the lessons I've done recently is proper hydration. And that is another yes. area. I don't know if you have any comments about that in particular when we talk about sarcopenia and how that fits in. The uh, for every molecule of, 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 well, I would say that the vegetables you eat are a fantastic source of water. So, so having organic veggies is a fantastic source of hydration in the first place. And a lot of other people who don't have vegetables will have a meal that actually sort of ends up as a net dehydration effect whereas that meal can be a positive hydration effect we don't want to drink lots of water with every meal because i could you know you have a, have a have a glass or don't have more than that because it can dilute digestive juices particularly as one gets older um and so hydration and what i i like to start the day that the thirst mechanism doesn't work properly so we, we have to as read the best way to engage your thirst mechanism is to drink about four to five hundred mils possibly in a relatively short period of time first thing in the morning I found this to be so effective. It actually then it helps you to maintain a, a useful true thirst for the rest of the day. Mm. Um, and uh, so I find it a, a brilliant way of starting. So trying to get people to drink water when they don't like it and don't feel thirsty is very hard. And unless you say, right, one thing you do only, and that's drink maybe 400 mils first thing in the morning in, in a relatively sh short order, just to drink that much. And it really sets the scene for them being wanting to drink more water later on the day. It's a wonderful thing. Try it. See if it works for you. He says. Beautiful. Uh, Beautiful. I love it. Anthony, this has just been jam packed with fantastic um, strategies to help counter this, what we might think as inevitable decline in muscle wasting, but it's not inevitable. There are things that we can do, but it takes that, that decision. Oh. And then it takes proactive. It's practice, a decision. Yeah. Right. Decision and, da and daily activity. It's decision and daily doing. And if you create the habit, then it becomes anything that becomes an, anything, anything, anything that's an effort. If you create the habit, it becomes effortless. And so for me, although I, I, I lift, you know, I do resistance work and it's actually I do my utmost and it's the, and I do I operate to failure where I, I literally can't do another one of the repetitions or movement on the bands, or whatever it might be. I go to failure, but it actually ceases to be a challenge. It ceases to be hard because I'm so used to doing it. It's the only it's the only way to go. It's the only way to go is to I, I find a workout without it actually being hard isn't a workout. And maybe maybe you've come back from injury, you've done something. You, this is so boring. I can't do boring exercise. And so for me, uh, I, I'm genuinely interested. So it's also a brilliant way. This is an important point. The more intense the exercise, maybe the last point, the more intense the exercise, partner, the more your body, just like yoga, the more your mind is in your body. And the more, therefore, it achieves the ability of resting those parts of the brain that would be overworking and overthinking and maybe creating anxiety, creating a lot of thoughts. So the exercise itself becomes a moving meditation. Even though it could be an intense huff and puff meditation, which, which might sound contrary, but I would say I would maintain that contrary to yoga is a meditation. It's a moving meditation. And so the, the beauty of the engaging the exercise is you rest the brain. You rest the brain with meditation, with this form of exercise where it's intense enough for you to be fully engaged and when you sleep. So Sorry. beautiful. And I, I think on that. that note, we have we have just encompassed some you know a challenge to our viewers. Yeah. You know, yes. which which I, of these things will you take from this? What will you do to up your game. Will you monitor or measure how you're doing now? Will you ch check your grip strength? You know, will you yeah. commit to well, doing something that challenges you and then tell a friend, I love that, and then put it yeah. in the calendar, whatever works for you. I know that if I don't put it in the calendar, it doesn't get done just like you, my friend. So mm. <laughs> what else would you like yeah. to add Best to this? Intentions. No, I, th I think what it's so, of course, if, if you want to change where you're at and you want to change the course of where you're going, you then and you can discover the way you're going is a trajectory which is a less attractive one and maybe fulfilling the, the footsteps of your parents. And it's not what you like. So let's say you maybe listen to saying, well, actually, I don't want this. I don't want this. Well, there's only one thing to do, and that's change what you're doing. And so it, it reminds me of the famous Albert Einstein quote on insanity, which is effectively insanity is defined as 
as expecting a different outcome from doing the very same things. Mm-hmm. So really, we need to change what we're doing. And we're suggesting that you make these changes. Now, they're not, n- they're not numerous, but they are daily. And so it's, de- and I, I have to say, I'm, a, I'm just an absolute fan of daily habits. Engage, create daily habits. And it, it may take up to maximum, typically, for about 40, 42 days to create a habit, which is then something you do automatically without even thinking about you need to do something because you get so it's so habituated so let's create healthy addictions healthy habits i'm not against the word addiction i think we're all addicted to something and there's no problem with that it's just a question what is it we're addicted to so i would say create a healthy addiction create healthy habits and then literally and then 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 you're running then you're running and then it's effortless and then then there is the new you there is the young there is the younger you heading this way rather than bye over there and then you're not you're not in the group of fast walkers on the beach anymore (laughs) You actually look better on the beach when you do it. So this has just been such a pleasure and a treasure talking with you, Anthony. I've so enjoyed it. And again, you are a magnificent um, verbal presenter. You're you're great with all of this. You've been doing it and seeing over 18,000 people. I don't even know how that's possible in a (sighs) lifetime. But the fact that you've been doing this and witnessing in your clients these transformations is testimony to what you're doing in these strategies work yeah thank you thank you and i think i think it's a, a, a i mean i have said that the the excitement that i have about an individual improving their health actually it feels the same as it was in 1992 so that doesn't change now i think that i think is a blessing for me i feel so fortunate i am so grateful for the fact that i'm engaged in a process although i have to say for the first 15 years you know really hard work in terms of the world knowing about nutrition now now actually i've seen clients and literally all over the world but it's uh and, and seen some famous people etc cetera, etc cetera, which may or may not be a, a good thing but it's just i, I feel blessed because when i have a, a, that relationship and that person improves their health i, I actually i have the reward which, which to me is a wonderful feeling on the inside um for them having made those changes and, and and achieved that now i know we need to we need to actually end here yes um because of time but thank you so much for having me i look forward to our next conversation and maybe you get feedback from your listeners as to as to what they're going to engage in so you, we give some i feedback can't on wait that. i can't wait so i many, will share so that so many feedback. other subjects to talk about so many others and and we would be continued but, yeah. particularly what i want sure. you to okay what were you going to say no, well particularly particularly, particularly the, the the i was going to say particularly the infection connection with autoimmunity we will do that next Anthony, you be well. Fantastic. Take great care of yourself. Can't okay. wait for the next time. Bye. Bye for now, everyone. Thanks so much, Palmer. Bye. And that's a wrap. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe, share it with your friends and family. And if you feel inspired, please leave a quick review so other people can find it too. Now, if you want to beat autoimmune and thrive, make sure you sign up for my free video training at freeautoimmunetraining.com. That's freeautoimmunetraining.com. And watch the first video right away. Take good care. Bye for now.